Eric Fromm was a 20th century philosopher and psychoanalyst. As a psychoanalyst, Fromm was inevitably influenced by the work of Sigmund Freud, that infamous father of psychoanalysis. These days, it isn't unusual to see criticism, suspicion, and mockery directed towards Freud's ideas, but Fromm was challenging Freudian thinking long before it was fashionable to do so. Fromm's criticism was always conducted in good faith, making his conclusions all the more interesting. One clear distinction Fromm drew between his own approach versus Freud's was the attitude towards sex. As Fromm stated, since Freud assumed that the basic motivating forces are sexual ones, he arrived at concepts like oral, anal, or genital characters. If one does not share this assumption, one is forced to devise different character types. Fromm redefined these character types as the receptive, the exploitative, the hoarding, the marketing, and the productive orientations. Fromm reminds us that, while the character orientations are treated here separately, the character of any given person is usually a blend of all or some of these orientations, in which one, however, is dominant. Fromm said that, in the receptive orientation, a person feels the source of all good to be outside, and they believe that the only way to get what they want, be it something material, be it affection, love, knowledge, pleasure, is to receive it from that outside source. In this orientation, the problem of love is almost exclusively that of being loved and not that of loving. Such people tend to be indiscriminate in the choice of their love objects, because being loved by anybody is such an overwhelming experience for them that they fall for anybody who gives them love or what looks like love. They are exceedingly sensitive to any withdrawal or rebuff they experience on the part of the loved person. Their orientation is the same in the sphere of thinking. If intelligent, they make the best listeners, since their orientation is one of receiving, not of producing ideas. Left to themselves, they feel paralysed. If religious, these persons have a concept of God in which they expect everything from God and nothing from their own activity. If not religious, their relationship to persons or institutions is very much the same. They are always in search of a magic helper. They show a particular kind of loyalty, at the bottom of which is the gratitude for the hand that feeds them and their fear of ever losing it. Since they need many hands to feel secure, they have to be loyal to numerous people. It is difficult for them to say no, and they are easily caught between conflicting loyalties and promises. Since they cannot say no, they love to say yes to everything and everybody, and the resulting paralysis of their critical abilities makes them increasingly dependent on others. They are dependent not only on authorities for knowledge and help, but on people in general for any kind of support. They feel lost when alone because they feel that they cannot do anything without help. This helplessness is especially important with regard to those acts which by their very nature can only be done alone, making decisions and taking responsibility. In personal relationships, for instance, they ask advice from the very person with regard to whom they have to make a decision. They have a great fondness for food and drink and tend to overcome anxiety and depression by eating or drinking. The mouth is an especially prominent feature, often the most expressive one. The lips tend to be open, as if in a state of continuous expectation of being fed. By and large, the outlook of people of this receptive orientation is optimistic and friendly. They have a certain confidence in life and its gifts, but they become anxious and distraught when their source of supply is threatened. They often have a genuine warmth and a wish to help others, but doing things for others also assumes the function of securing their favour. While the receptive orientation is discouraged, it is by no means absent. The need to conform and to please leads to the feeling of helplessness, which is the root of subtle receptiveness in modern people. People expect that in every field there is an expert who can tell them how things are and how they ought to be done. There are experts for science, experts for happiness, and writers become experts in the art of living by the very fact that they are authors of bestsellers. 
This subtle but rather general receptiveness assumes somewhat grotesque forms in modern folklore, fostered particularly by advertising. Everyone knows that realistically, the get-rich-quick schemes do not work. There is a widespread daydream of the effortless life. From said that, the exploitative orientation, like the receptive, has as its basic premise the feeling that the source of all good is outside, that whatever one wants to get must be sought there, and that one cannot produce anything oneself. The difference between the two, however, is that the exploitative type does not expect to receive things from others as gifts, but to take away from others by force or cunning. This orientation extends to all spheres of activity. In the realm of love and affection, these people tend to grab and steal. They feel attracted only to people whom they can take away from somebody else. Attractiveness to them is conditioned by a person's attachment to somebody else. They tend not to fall in love with an unattached person. We find the same attitude with regard to thinking and intellectual pursuits. Such people will tend not to produce ideas, but to steal them. This may be done directly in the form of plagiarism or more subtly, by repeating in different phraseology the ideas voiced by others and insisting they are new and their own. It is a striking fact that frequently, people with great intelligence proceed in this way, although if they relied on their own gifts, they might well be able to have these ideas of their own. The same statement holds true with regard to their orientation to material things. Things which they can take away from others always seem better to them than anything they can produce themselves. They use and exploit anybody and anything from whom or from which they can squeeze something. Their motto is, stolen fruits are sweetest. Because they want to use and exploit people, they love those who, explicitly or implicitly, are promising objects of exploitation and get fed up with persons whom they have squeezed out. This orientation seems to be symbolised by the biting mouth, which is often a prominent feature in such people. It is not a play upon words to point out that they often make biting remarks about others. Their attitude is coloured by a mixture of hostility and manipulation. Everyone is an object of exploitation and is judged according to their usefulness, instead of the confidence and optimism which characterises the receptive type. One finds here suspicion and cynicism, envy and jealousy. The exploitative character, with its motto, I take what I need, goes back to piratical and feudal ancestors and goes forward from there to the robber barons who exploited the natural resources of the continent. The pariah and adventure capitalists, to use Max Weber's terms, roaming the earth for profit, are men of this stamp, who ruthlessly pursued power and wealth. The free market as it operated in the 18th and 19th centuries under competitive conditions nurtured this type. Our own age has seen a revival of exploitativeness in the authoritarian systems which attempted to exploit the natural and human resources of any other country they were powerful enough to invade. While the receptive and exploitative types are similar in as much as both expect to get things from the outside world, this orientation makes people have little faith in anything new they might get from the outside world. Their security is based upon hoarding and saving, while spending is felt to be a threat. They have surrounded themselves, as it were, by a protective wall, and their main aim is to bring as much as possible into this fortified position and to let as little as possible out of it. Their miserliness refers to money and material things as well as to feelings and thoughts. Love is essentially a possession. They do not give love, but try to get it by possessing the beloved. The hoarding person often shows a particular kind of faithfulness towards people and even toward memories. Their sentimentality makes the past appear as golden. They hold onto it and indulge in the memories of bygone feelings and experiences. 
They know everything but are sterile and incapable of productive thinking. One can recognise these people too by facial expressions and gestures. Theirs is the tight-lipped mouth. Their gestures are characteristic of their withdrawn attitude. Another characteristic element in this attitude is the pedantic orderliness. The hoarder will be orderly with things, thoughts or feelings. But again, as with memory, their orderliness is sterile and rigid. They cannot endure things out of place and will automatically rearrange them. Orderliness signifies mastering the world outside by putting it and keeping it in its proper place in order to avoid the danger of intrusion. Their compulsive cleanliness is another expression of the need to undo contact with the outside world. Things have to be put not only in their proper place but also into their proper time. Obsessive punctuality is characteristic of the hoarding type. It is another form of mastering the outside world. If the outside world is experienced as a threat to one's fortified position, obstinacy is a logical reaction. A constant no is the almost automatic defence against intrusion, sitting tight, the answer to danger of being pushed. These people tend to feel that they possess only a fixed quantity of strength, energy or mental capacity, and that this stock is diminished or exhausted by use and can never be replenished. They cannot understand the self-replenishing function of all living substances, and that activity and use of one's own powers increase strength while stagnation paralyzes. The act of creation is a miracle of which they hear, but in which they do not believe. To them, death and destruction have more reality than life and growth. Their highest values are order and security. Their motto, there is nothing new under the sun. In their relationship to others, intimacy is a threat. Either remoteness or possession of a person means security. The hoarder tends to be more suspicious and to have a particular sense of justice, which in effect says, mine is mine and yours is yours. The hoarding orientation existed side by side with the exploitative orientation in the 18th and 19th centuries. The hoarding type was conservative, less interested in ruthless acquisition than the methodical economic pursuits based on sound principles and on the preservation of what had been acquired. Puritan ethics, with the emphasis on work and success as evidence of goodness, supported the feeling of security and tended to give life meaning and a religious sense of fulfilment. From said that, the marketing orientation developed as a dominant one only in the modern era. In order to understand its nature, one must consider the economic function of the market in modern society as the main condition for its development in modern people. Barter is one of the oldest economic mechanisms. The traditional local market, however, is essentially different from the market as it has developed in modern capitalism. Bartering on a local market offered an opportunity to meet for the purpose of exchanging commodities. Producers and customers became acquainted. They were relatively small groups. The demand was more or less known, so the producer could produce for this specific demand. The modern market is no longer a meeting place, but a mechanism characterised by abstract and impersonal demand. One produces for this market, not for a known circle of customers. Its verdict is based on laws of supply and demand, and it determines whether the commodity can be sold and at what price. No matter what the use value of a pair of shoes may be, for instance, if the supply is greater than the demand, some shoes will be sentenced to economic death. They might as well not have been produced at all. The market day is the day of judgment as far as the exchange value of commodities is concerned. The listener may object that this description of the market is oversimplified. The producer does try to judge the demand in advance and even under monopoly conditions obtains a certain degree of control over it. Nevertheless, the function of the market has been, and still is, predominant enough to have a profound influence. The emphasis on exchange value rather than use value has led to a similar concept of value with regard to people and particularly to oneself. The marketing orientation is rooted in the experience of oneself as a commodity and of one's value as exchange value. In our time, the marketing orientation has been growing rapidly, together with the development of the personality market. 
Most people are dependent for their material success on a personal acceptance by those who need their services or who employ them. It is true, our economic system could not function if people were not skilled and were gifted only with a pleasant personality. However, success depends largely on how well a person sells themselves on the market, how well they get their personality across, how nice a package they are, whether they are cheerful, sound, aggressive, reliable, ambitious. Furthermore, what their family background is, what clubs they belong to, and whether they know the right people. A stockbroker, a salesman, a secretary, a railroad executive, a college professor, or a hotel manager must each offer different kinds of personality that, regardless of their differences, must fulfil one condition, to be in demand. The fact that in order to have success, it is not sufficient to have the skill and equipment for performing a given task, but that one must be able to put across one's personality in competition with many others shapes the attitude towards oneself. If it were enough for the purpose of making a living to rely on what one knows and what one can do, one's self-esteem would be in proportion to one's capacities, that is, to one's use value. But since success depends largely on how one sells one's personality, one experiences oneself as a commodity, or rather, simultaneously, as the seller and the commodity to be sold. A person is not concerned with their life and happiness, but with becoming saleable. This feeling might be compared to that of each commodity. Of handbags on a counter, for instance, could they feel and think? Each handbag would try to make itself as attractive as possible in order to obtain a higher price than its rivals. The handbag sold for the highest price would feel elated, since it would mean that it was the most valuable one. The one which was not sold would feel sad and convinced of its own worthlessness. This fate might befall the bag which, though excellent in its appearance and usefulness, had the bad luck of being out of date because of a change in fashion. Like the handbag, one has to be in fashion on the personality market, and in order to be in fashion, one has to know what kind of personality is most in demand. This knowledge is transmitted in a general way throughout the whole process of education, from kindergarten to college, and implemented by the family. The more specific picture of the models for success, one gets elsewhere. The media show the pictures of the successful in many variations. Their function is to serve as the link an average person has with the world of the great, even if we cannot hope to become as successful as they are, we can try to emulate them. They are saints, and because of their success, they embody the norms for living. Since modern people experience themselves both as the seller and as the commodity to be sold on the market, their self-esteem depends on conditions beyond their control. If they were successful, they are valuable. If they are not, they are worthless. The degree of insecurity which results from this orientation can hardly be overestimated. If one feels that one's own value is not constituted primarily by the human qualities one possesses, but by one's own success in a competitive market with ever-changing conditions, one's self-esteem is bound to be shaky and in constant need of confirmation by others. Helplessness, insecurity, and inferiority feelings are the result. But the problem is not only that of self-esteem, but of one's identity with oneself. In the marketing orientation, people encounter their own powers as commodities alienated from themselves. They are not one with them because what matters is not their self-realisation in the process of using them, but their success in the process of selling them. Both our powers and what they create become estranged, something different from themselves, something for others to judge and to use. Thus, our feeling of identity becomes as shaky as our own self-esteem. It is constituted by the sum total of roles one can play, I am as you desire me. This process is not different from what happens to commodities on the market. A painting and a pair of shoes can both be expressed in and reduced to their exchange value, their price on the market. Their individuality, that which is peculiar and unique in them, is valueless and, in fact, a ballast. The word equality has also changed its meaning. Today, equality has become equivalent to interchangeability and is the very negation of individuality. Equality, instead of being the condition for the development of each person's peculiarity, means the extinction of individuality. Equality has become synonymous with indifference, and, indeed, indifference is what characterises the modern person's relationship to themselves and others. These conditions necessarily colour all human relationships. When the individual self is neglected, 
the relationships between people become superficial, because not themselves but interchangeable commodities are related. However, the market creates a kind of comradeship of its own. Everyone is involved in the same battle of competition, shares the same striving for success, all meet under the same conditions of the market. Or at least, they believe they do. Everyone knows how the others feel, because each is in the same boat. Alone, afraid to fail, eager to please, no quarter is given or expected in this battle. The superficial character of human relationships leads many to hope that they can find depth and intensity of feeling in individual love. But love for one person and love for one's neighbours are indivisible. Hence, it is all an illusion to expect that the loneliness of a person rooted in the marketing orientation can be cured by individual love. Thinking as well as feeling is determined by the marketing orientation. Thinking assumes the function of grasping things quickly so as to be able to manipulate them successfully. This leads to a high degree of intelligence, but not of reason. For manipulative purposes, all that is necessary to know is the surface features of things, the superficial. Knowledge itself becomes a commodity. People become alienated from their own power. Thinking and knowledge are experienced as a tool to produce results. Knowledge of ourselves, psychology, which was held to be the condition for virtue, for right living, for happiness, has degenerated into an instrument to be used for better manipulation of others and oneself, in market research, in political propaganda, in advertising, and so on. We find today a tremendous enthusiasm for knowledge and education, but at the same time a sceptical or contemptuous attitude towards the allegedly impractical and useless thinking which is concerned only with the truth and which has no exchange value on the market. The marketing orientation does not come out of the 18th or 19th centuries. It is definitely a modern product. It is only recently that the package, the label, the brand name has become important in people as well as in commodities. The gospel of working loses weight and the gospel of selling becomes paramount. To get ahead, we are expected to fit into large organisations and our ability to play the expected role is one of our main assets. Everything is transformed into a commodity. Not only things, but the person themselves, their physical energy, their skills, their knowledge, their opinions, their feelings, even their smiles. This character type is a historically new phenomenon because it is the product of a fully developed capitalism that is centred around the market, the commodity market, the labour market, and the personality market. The previous character types are possible as long as there is real sensuous experience of one's own body, its functions, and its products. Cybernetic people are so alienated that they experience their body only as an instrument for success. Their body must look youthful and healthy. It is experienced as a most precious asset on the personality market. The world becomes a sum of lifeless artefacts, from synthetic food to synthetic organs. The whole person becomes part of the total machinery that they control and are simultaneously controlled by. They have no plan, no goal for life, except doing what the logic of technique determines them to do. The marketing orientation is based on detachment from others. The whole principle of the marketing orientation implies easy contact, superficial attachment, and detachment from others in a deeper emotional sense. In this orientation, those qualities are developed which can best be sold. Some roles would not fit in with the peculiarities of a person. Therefore, we must do away with them, not with the roles, but with the peculiarities. The marketing orientation must be free, free of all individuality. One modern manifestation of the marketing orientation is the world of reality TV. Whatever the supposed purpose of a show, singing, dancing, modeling, baking, marriage, drama, or love, selling yourself to the judges, fellow contestants, and or public is a crucial element to get ahead in most reality shows. Often selling one's personality becomes the theme itself, even if it involves taking on the role of the villain or anti-hero. Authenticity is usually one of the most lucrative traits a contestant can portray. There is often a ruthless, alienating, and degrading format to reality TV, with various motifs on the survival of the fittest. Fame and career opportunities follow for the chosen ones. Whilst the majority of people might not actively participate as contestants on reality TV, we nevertheless participate as viewers and consumers. Aversion to the personality market can be found in the general attitude towards social media. It is widely accepted that this virtual world damages our well-being, yet we cannot turn away. People become images, commodities, 
carefully curated avatars, we barter with our profile in competition with the profiles of other people. The number of followers and engagement we produce determines our success, dictating our value both socially and financially. We become our own brand. We idolise and we become idols. The impersonal algorithm is ever-present, deciding our fate. The depersonalization, the emptiness, the meaningless of life will result in growing dissatisfaction and a need to search for a more adequate way of living. The productive orientation refers to a fundamental attitude, a mode of relatedness in all realms of human experience. It covers mental, emotional and sensory responses to others, to oneself and to things. Productiveness is the ability to use our powers and to realise the potential inherent in ourselves. The term productive is apt to be confused with active and productiveness with activity. While the two terms can be synonymous, activity in modern usage frequently indicates the very opposite of productiveness. Activity is usually defined as behaviour which brings about a change in the existing situation by an expenditure of energy. This current concept of activity does not distinguish between the underlying psychic conditions governing the activities. An example, though an extreme one, of non-productive activity is the activity of a person under hypnosis. The person in a deep hypnotic trance may have their eyes open, may walk, talk and do things. They act. The general definition of activity would apply to them. A common type of non-productive activity is the reaction to anxiety, whether acute or chronic, conscious or unconscious, which is frequently at the root of the frenetic preoccupations of people today. Among the most powerful sources of activity are irrational passions. The person who is driven by stinginess, masochism, jealousy and all other forms of greed is compelled to act, yet their actions are neither free nor rational. They are active, but they are not productive. Although the source of these activities is irrational, there can be important practical results, often leading to material success. In the concept of productiveness, we are not concerned with activity necessarily leading to practical results. We are concerned with a person's character, not with their success. The world outside can be experienced in two ways. Reproductively, by perceiving actuality in the same fashion as a film makes a literal record of things photographed, and generatively, by enlivening it and recreating this new material through the spontaneous activity of one's own mental and emotional powers. While to a certain extent everyone does react in both ways, the respective weight of each kind of experience differs widely. Sometimes either one of the two is atrophied. The relative atrophy of the generative capacity is very frequent in our culture. A person may be able to recognise things as they are, but they are unable to enliven their perception from within. Such a person is the perfect realist, who sees all there is to be seen of the surface features of phenomena, but who is quite incapable of penetrating below the surface to the essential, and of visualising what is not yet apparent. They see the details but not the whole, the trees but not the forest. Reality to them is only the sum total of what has already materialised. On the other hand, for the psychotic person, actual reality is wiped out and an inner reality has taken its place. The realist sees only the surface features of things, they see the manifest world, they can reproduce it photographically in their mind, and they can act by manipulating things and people as they appear in this picture. The insane person is incapable of seeing reality as it is. The sickness of the psychotic is such that they cannot function socially. The sickness of the realist impoverishes them as a human being. Realism seems to be the very opposite of insanity, and yet it is only its complement. The true opposite of realism and insanity is productiveness. The presence of both reproductive and generative capacities is a precondition for productiveness. They are opposite poles whose interaction is the dynamic source of productiveness. Productiveness is not the combination of both capacities, it is something new which springs from this interaction. The polarity between objectivity and subjectivity is characteristic of productive thinking as it is of productiveness in general. In productive thinking, the subject is not indifferent to their object but is affected by and concerned with it. The subject is intensely interested in his object and the more intimate the relation is, the more fruitful is their thinking. They are affected by it and react to it. They care and respond. To be objective is possible only if we respect the things we observe, that is, if we are capable of seeing them in their uniqueness and their interconnectedness. 
Objectivity requires not only seeing the object as it is, but also seeing oneself as one is. But objectivity is not, as it is often implied in a false sense of scientific objectivity, synonymous with detachment. With absence of interest and care, objectivity does not mean detachment, it means respect. That is, the ability not to distort and to falsify things, persons and oneself. The statement that productiveness is an intrinsic human faculty contradicts the idea that people are lazy by nature and that they have to be forced to be active. This assumption is an old one. When Moses asked Pharaoh to let the Jewish people go so that they might serve God in the desert, his answer was, you are lazy, nothing but lazy. To Pharaoh, slave labor meant doing things. Worshipping God was laziness. The same idea was adopted by all those who wanted to profit from the activity of others and had no use for productiveness, which they could not exploit. Our own culture seems to offer evidence for the very opposite. For the last few centuries, Western people have been obsessed by the idea of work, by the need for constant activity. Laziness and compulsive activity are not opposite, but are two symptoms of the disturbance of proper functioning. Compulsive activity is not the opposite of laziness, but it's complement. The opposite of both is productiveness. Certain basic elements are characteristic of all forms of productive love. These are care, responsibility, respect, and knowledge. To love productively is incompatible with being passive, with being an onlooker at the loved person's life. It implies labour and care are the responsibility for their growth. People are concerned with the question of whether they are attractive, while they forget that the essence of attractiveness is their own capacity to love. From believed in both nature and nurture informing the development of a person's character. However, as he pointed out, environment is never the same for two people, for the differences in constitution make them experience the same environment in different ways. As touched upon in the introduction, Fromm emphasised that the character orientations which have been described so far are by no means as separate from one another as it may appear from this sketch. The receptive orientation, for instance, may be dominant in a person, but it is usually blended with any or all of the other orientations. The positive and negative aspects are not two separate classes of syndromes. Each of these traits can be described as a point in a continuum which is determined by the degree of the productive orientation which prevails. We see a staggering amount of variability brought about by the fact that the non-productive orientations are blended in different ways depending on the respective weight of each of them. Each changes in quality according to the amount of productiveness present. The different orientations may operate in different strengths in the material, emotional or intellectual spheres of activity, respectively. Fromm continues that, if we add to the picture of personality the different temperaments and gifts, we can easily recognise that the configuration of these basic elements makes for an endless number of variations in personality. Certainly, some of Fromm's ideas were consciously built upon the work of Sigmund Freud. However, this system is one of the best examples of how Fromm refined and improved the theories of the original father of psychoanalysis. Thank you for watching this episode on the Eric From channel. If you enjoyed it, then uh, we do hope you'll subscribe and like this episode and uh, stick around for the next one. Thank you very much.